Hi, welcome to Essential Ingredients. I'm your host, Justine Reichman. Today, I want to welcome David Cooper, partner, DAF Capital Partners. For those of you watching the video, you probably know that it is DAF Capital Partners. For those listening, I just wanted to spell that out for you. And Maggie Spicer, entrepreneur, strategist, fund manager, and impact advisor. Welcome, Dave. Welcome, Maggie. Thank you so much for joining me. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Justine. Great to be here. Great to have you. So I'm excited to just have this conversation. And one thing that I was really excited to just talk about today, because we talk about this all the time, impact advising, but I do, I realize that we talk about it, but a lot of people don't know what it is. So I would love for us to just chat about what is impact advising and impact investing. Um, it seems second nature to us, but I know a lot of people are unfamiliar with this term. So can I just get maybe you, David, or you, Maggie, to just jump off with in your interpretation of what impact investing is? Sure, I'll, I'll give you the sort of classic impact investing, advising sort of um, framework, which is doing something positive for social and environmental change, investing in corporations or mission and purpose-driven entrepreneurship that is focused on sort of systems change or some other sort of um, model around a business that um, gives something back. It gives something back to, to, to humanity. It gives something back to the plant world in terms of regenerative um, agriculture or organic agriculture. And, or it gives something back to our systems, our food systems in particular, um, or our renewable energy systems or what have you. So these are sort of impacts. So what they're really meaning is they're non-extractive in their mode. In other words, they're trying to invest in models or business models that are really uh, future forward, um, knowing that the existing models tend to be uh, not so applicable in our, our current environment and our current sort of business and economic cycles. And so the question then becomes impact. Early impact was more philanthropy. It was more sort of give it away and sort of um, donate into cause. Um, about 20 years ago, impact investing became a thing where impact investors and, and sort of social entrepreneurs and philanthropic sort of investors looked at their portfolios and said, well, maybe we can invest um, in a different way. We can invest for impact, which means that we're going to invest in social and environmental enterprise and we're going to expect something in return other than just a positive outcome, meaning philanthropy that you give something away and expect something back as positive. So we want money back and we want to basically say that impact means that we can do this, we can get a return and we can compete with the traditional markets. And so the early form of impact was really about doing what was called a double, a double bottom line, right? Now there's triple bottom line, right, triple bottom bottom line. line. Yeah. Other things. but it was really this concept that I'm putting my money into something positive and I'm expecting a return and that return is going to compete with my traditional portfolios. And fast forward 20 years and now you have these large institutions saying, yeah, we get it. We're going to be impact investors now. And we have this, the, all these acronyms like ESG and so forth, um, SDG impact and ESG impact and all these things where we're comparing our metrics to something positive and we're comparing our metrics around a financial return. And we've proven as a group that that's possible. And so that's the sort of a traditional framework of impact and some of its early legacy, which is an alternative to philanthropy. And it's alternative investment. So you hear a lot of angel investors um, investing in impact in food systems or in environmental systems, renewable energy, water, um, wind, solar, all these things as a way of providing capital for early entrepreneurship that is really focused on making a difference in a future forward way. So just, I want to go back to this impact investing because you had touched on uh, philanthropy and people thinking about philanthropy and then impact investing. And one of the things that resonated with me with impact investing and the B Corp and all these kinds of things is being able to do something good in the world and make money. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like the perfect way to yep. do business. It seemed like the, like, why not? Why wouldn't everybody want to do that? Yeah, well, it's very true. And this is why you have large institutions like BlackRock saying we're committed to ESG and you have large private equity groups like TPG 
putting billions of dollars into the RISE Fund, which is focused on impact. And one of their most recent transactions was to take a large position in Rad Power Bikes. And why? Because Rad Power Bikes is one of the leaders in alternative transportation me mechanisms and methodologies. And they're really expanding nationally, if not internationally, around an alternative way to move around. And so the RISE Fund is taking a position in that particular company to really give them the capital they need to, to move the needle in terms of alternative forms of transportation and electric bikes are not a fad. They're here, people are adopting to them. COVID has been extremely friendly to the electric bike industry. And so now you have capital moving into it. And that is at the very far end of the spectrum. Um, you have many uh, large institutional investors saying, ESG, we will not put money in your company unless you apply those particular principles about social governance and environment. And that's a metric that they then adhere to. And if there's failures in those metrics, they pull the money. And this is a way to force change. But in our world, which is not BlackRock and TPG and Rise Fund and all these incredibly sort of magnificent amounts of capital that fly around, we're really dealing with entrepreneurs. We're dealing with startups and those startups need money. And one of the best ways to do that is not necessarily the venture community, which of course is really about profit and how much can I get? Nothing against my friends and, and brothers in venture capital, but it's really the impact investors when we start thinking about food systems and we start thinking about small entrepreneurs who are just getting started and have an idea around a mission and purposeful type of allocation of their efforts into some kind of a food system shift or some sort of supply chain logistics, packaging, all these systems that are so integral to our, our feeding ourselves on this planet. How do you do that with angel investors and how do you do that with philanthropy and how do you do it in an environment where there's um, investment? In other words, there's something expected in return other than just sort of an outcome. In other words, money. In other words, I want to start with something and get more. And that's really where we have this sort of confluence between philanthropy, impact, and traditional investing. And this is a very active part of the world right now. And food entrepreneurs, um, groups like Food Funded, Slow Money, um, Jedi, these are organizations that are really trying to hybridize these two sort of concepts around traditional investing and philanthropy. I love that. And so before we go on, and I want to talk more about that, and I want to hear from Maggie too. You've mentioned this term ESG, which we've talked about a bunch, but for those that are listening that may be unfamiliar with it, can you just spell it out for everyone a little bit? Yeah, it's a, it's a framework around um, cre um, um, environment, social, and governance. So, so these are three metrics that large corporations basically sign up for. So there's a lot of different acronyms out there. There are B Corps and public benefit corps and all of these ways with which to say, hey, look at me. I'm trying to do it differently. I'm not an extractive industry and I'm not gonna do harm to the world. And one of the most institutional ways to do that is through this concept of ESG, which you can get reports from institutional reporting agencies around how Exxon is doing with their ESG commitment. And that's a commitment to environment, social and governance. Wonderful, thanks for explaining that. I just, I like to make sure that since we have founders and we have startups and we have people yep. at different stages that we're not talking above, we're talking with everybody and Absolutely. making sure we're inclusive. And there are more acronyms than there are vocabulary words to attach to them. <laughs> but the biggies are ESG. And some of the other ones like the SDGs, those are the, the sustainable development goals that were set by the UN. Many companies sort of fit into that framework and say, you know, I'm going to really focus my business model around e uh, SDG 9 or SDG 14 or whatever. And these are just ways to give people frameworks around if I'm going to pick an investment A versus B, what am I going to tie it to? Am I going to tie it to the SDGs? Am I going to tie it to the ESGs? And now we've got a new one, which is JEDI. And we have BIPOC now too. So, so all of these are just ways to sort of calibrate where we're going to focus our money and our attention and what we're really um, how we're aligning our intention with, with our investment strategies and, and where we're pointing our North Star. Great. Thank you so much for, for walking us through that and for giving everyone a little bit of greater insight into that vernacular too. So Maggie, I want everyone to get to know you a bit too as, as well. Uh, what got you in, into this industry? What inspired you? And how you're now involved in strategy and advising and in the impact investing world. 
Great question. Yeah. So my background is as an entrepreneur and um, actually Dave and I connected last summer on this uh, shared interest around donor advised funds and how you can have a huge impact through charitable capital uh, in place of risk capital, which is what he was alluding to earlier. And um, I've been a longtime supporter of local food systems in the food industry and uh, effectively um, started doing some research with Dave and um, and learning how the charitable capital world works. And, uh, and through that process, um, basically put some of these concepts to work um, you know, back last fall when, uh, when restaurants were really having a, a hard time with the pandemic. Um, you know, one thing that, that we talk about often is how you can actually support entrepreneurs and startups with charitable capital, which is um, increasingly practiced more and more. And effectively, we put together a fund, 86 fund, to make non-recoverable grants to barrier restaurants. And so uh, really, it was a, a sort of marriage of interests uh, and curiosities and saying, like, let's put this philosophy to work um, in a very practical, local way and move this capital quickly to get restaurants the, the emergency aid that they need. Um, so in a nutshell, that's sort of uh, the background of how it got to working together and, and um, supporting these initiatives uh, through charitable capital. That's great. And so you, that was inspired by COVID, obviously, right? And so what was the impact that you were able to have for those restaurants? It's been pretty incredible. We've, we've now been, been through two grant making cycles. Uh, we've supported uh, both newcomers to the scene, you know, effectively restaurants that have been excluded from government or small business aid because they simply didn't exist in 2019. And uh, just because of that doesn't mean that they haven't been hurting, you know, as, as the newest fledglings to the scene. And then also some uh, longer term institutions that have really shaped not only Bay Area dining, but also really made neighborhoods in a lot of cases. Um, and so we've been able to get them emergency aid in as, as short as uh, four to six weeks. Um, and they've been able to use it for, you know, all the categories that PPP loans would cover. But additionally, if there was something that they needed aid for, that a, PP, that a PPP loan wouldn't be forgiven for if they had used it as such, um, they're able to use the money from us to support those, um, those areas of, of immediate funding needs. Um, and then outside of that, uh, we're actually taking the, the fund moving forward towards supporting the broader ecosystem that uh, is sustained by keeping restaurants not only alive, but thriving. So looking at farmers, um, winemakers, beer makers, you know, ranchers, fishermen, women, et cetera. Um, and so the, the impact we've most recently been able to have with this last round of grants is effectively having each restaurant earmark a producer or two that will directly benefit from them getting this most recent grant. Um, so that's the impact we've had. And then as far as where we're going, it'll have this trickle down effect into um, these additional layers of the food system. That's wonderful. And so now as you come, as we hope to see some more normalcy and restaurants start to recover, hopefully, right? As we can open up and people can start to eat, dine again and uh, dine inside and outside and they can start to recover. How will, it, how will that impact what you're offering and how you're helping the restaurants and what you're offering? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think um, systemically, uh, you know, I know a lot of chefs and, and restaurant owners uh, and farmers and food producers and, and systemically there's been a challenge where the true cost of producing food, particularly on the West Coast, um, is a lot higher than what the average consumer is wanting to pay. Um, and so there's this disconnect because for years, the United States has, you know, placed all these subsidies, particularly around, you know, chicken farming and dairy, some of those bigger, you know, wheat, some of those bigger industries and monocropping where uh, the true cost of, of food has really been uh, below um, not only market rate, but really where it should be for a um, for living wage for a lot of people in those industries. So I, I share that because, you know, chefs were having these conversations before the pandemic, like how are we going to sustain paying a living wage? Uh, I mean, the classic adage is sort of between front of house and back of house where, you know, if the, if the chef owner moves towards a shared tip model where, you know, it, it isn't just tips going to the servers, the servers kind of have this, you know, cry of outrage because they're used to making a certain sum, but the, the folks cooking the food and preparing the food, you know, are oftentimes paid, you know, close to minimum wage because that's all the restaurant can afford from a you know, fixed cost standpoint. So um, I share that because when you look at it, the, 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 even after the pandemic or even at this late stage of the pandemic, um, restaurants still need a, a sizable sum to, to be profitable. And so I think, you know, in some cases we're seeing uh, menu formats change or we're seeing prices increase a bit. Um, 
to try to offset not only some of the losses from the past year, uh, but also to try to get those numbers closer to where they need to be. And so um, for better or for worse, I think we're gonna see a, more of a hollowing out of the sort of mid-tier restaurant and we'll see more of the fast casual and fine dining, which was again, already happening before the pandemic. And so where 86 Fund comes in or, or you know, the work that we're doing to support local food systems is saying, look, you know, if you can, you know, if you're already using your charitable capital to invest in areas that you, you support, um, giving money to uh, effectively as close as directly as you can to supporting farmers and restaurants. Um, it's, it's a way to get them additional capital that helps them uh, cover the bottom line um, and take on some initiatives. Like for example, um, a restaurant in San Francisco, Nopolito, they wanted to get a, or they have gotten a, um, a tortilla making machine uh, so that they can, you know, nick, you know, use their own um, masa, nixtamalize it and make uh, tortillas in house. And, you know, a lot of the tortillas that you get on the market are made with GMO corn. Um, you know, it's not organic, uh, it's mass produced. And so it's a simple example of how, you know, a restaurant without some additional aid, a lot of times can't afford to take on the machinery expense um, to, to reinvest in supporting, you know, the traditional way of making a particular ingredient or food stuff. So what's your overall, both of you, what's your overall mission as it relates to food and impact investing? Sure, I, I, just to go off that for a moment, and I think it circles back to that original concept. So part of the, the effort, um, and we're seeing this within the, the, the concept, the sort of the, the off uh, farm producers um, that are involved in regenerative ag. So in other words, there are restaurant chefs that are very committed to their local food system, the farm to fork movement, which we know was a few years ago, but really digging deep, bad pun in food for this concept of, of regen ag. In other words, mm -hmm. um, a regenerative model, which means you're putting as much back into the system as you're taking out. And mm -hmm. so, so much of impact investing, so much of, of sort of philanthropic venture investing, and and my <laughs> my my peers in the in in this space are always sort of cringe at that, like philanthropic venture investing. What the heck is that? But it really is philanthropy taking a bet on other types of system change. And whether that be inside of a corporation, which the Jedi um, folk, which is justice, um, um, equality, diversity, and inclusion inside natural products and food producers, where you're building a culture around BIPOC or BPOC, some people say, where you're starting to really advance these sort of blended sort of colors inside the natural um, products and natural foods food businesses, which tend to be controlled, you know, by a corporation or a corporate infrastructure that can give them the capital to do what they're doing. So now you're getting chefs, you're getting local community restaurants to build um, sort of relationships with food producers that are committed to Regen Ag. Well, Regen Ag is an expensive way with which to produce food. It's more expensive than organics. And so there's a capital requirement and also a sales sort of flow of that. And so how do you start to advance those particular transitions in our food systems? The chefs are on the front line. They're asking these producers to do that. And we're 86 Fund and we're other types of organizations that are in support of this particular transition can help is by getting these capital into the hands and promoting sort of um, six months worth of, of inventory purchasing or so forth to take a bet on these small producers and these off-farm producers that are providing this type of nutrition to these chefs into these channels and then into the into the mouths of, of us consumers. And so these are innovative ways with which to support these transitional type of um, processes and these business models that are taking a risk on a different type of food system in the future. Essential Ingredients is powered by Next Gen Chef. Next Gen Chef is a movement that supports food and beverage entrepreneurs around the world by fostering a sense of community and providing its members access to mentors and a wealth of resources and guidance. Next Gen Chef feeds members with the knowledge they need to build better for you food and beverage businesses so the world can have greater access to healthier food, comprehensive food education, and increased affordability. If you like what you hear on this podcast, continue the conversation or ask new questions on the Next Gen Chef app, available in the Apple Store and Google Play. Follow Next Gen Chef on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook at Next Gen Chef. Join Next Gen Chef and let's change the future of the food industry together.
that's great. And I, and I really appreciate you sharing that because it really clarifies it and it draws a picture that I can really visualize. So um, I really, I, I think that that's really important to share. So thank you for sharing that. And it really goes with another question that I had, which is about regenerative and sustainable and the market. And I'm curious about the investors and, you know, whether or not, you know, is that spigot, is it flowing for investment right now? Are people really excited about investing in that uh, area right now? Um, so there's two ways to think of it, and I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Maggie for the on the ground because she <laughs> works with the chefs and she works with the restaurants, and we support a restaurant through the last round of funding. We supported a restaurant in Sonoma, mm -hmm. uh, in the city of Sonoma, which is committed to regenerative and biodynamic uh, ingredient, and are sourcing that all the way through the food column, whether it be what you drink and what you eat. So they're very focused on, on a, a bottle shop model around biodynamics and other types of regenerative mechanisms. Um, and then our food, food is also being sourced that way. And this is becoming now sort of um, organic, you know, phase two. Um, you know, we all w lived through the organic phase one in the late 70s, or maybe not lived through it in the late 70s, but when it got its start. And those are legacy sort of, um, patrons of organics that started this movement. And now we're getting into sort of late stage organics where we wonder what organic really means anymore. Regenerative is going through the same type of thing. I mean, obviously um, permaculture and these types of food mechanisms have been around for many, many years, but they're becoming now mainstream because we're seeing that monolithic sort of monocrop architecture in terms of food production, institutional food production is not serving us. It's actually doing us a disservice. So how do you sort of rechain? How do you sort of change the dialogue? And regenerative ag is one of this way. We start at the soil and we work all the way up to what we eat. And we do it in a way where we're putting more into the system than we're taking out. And that makes a lot of sense from both a systems approach, but also makes sense in terms of nutrition. Because if the soil is not healthy, we're not, we're not right. getting healthy food. So this is kind of the mechanism of, of, of sort of modality, me mechanism, of me a mechanism of madness, so to speak. And so the, the institutional world, the, the General Mills, the Danones, the sort of large players understand this. They understand that these crop systems are, have sort of reached their peak and they're no longer able to squeeze another grain of, of, of corn or another kernel of corn, another grain of, of something out of wheat. And so they're thinking about it more sort of in a perennial model. They're looking at these soils conditions and they're, they're really listening. And they're doing that in major investment. They're doing it in investment though through their philanthropic models. And they know that the public is now aware of these types of um, the conditions around food that maybe our food isn't as healthy as we think. Um, so there is an ear to it and the money that's flowing tends to be big. There's a fund that I work with by the name of Replant and they're working with General Mills, they're working with Danone and they're working in the soil. They're actually investing in the soil with these regenerative farms. They're working with perennial grains that have a deeper root system. They're really thinking about this in a long-term type of a, of, of a perspective. Now, Maggie works with the farmers and the chefs and all the people that actually do the, do the delivery of these, these wonderful sort of alternative mechanisms of growing the food in very healthy soil. So I'll let her sort of talk about that. Yeah, so I would I would add that um, you know farmers are are just starting to see how depleted the soils are and and our resources. I mean, as we all know, we're in a, a, a drought in California and it's only getting worse. So I think they're already in many cases thinking about how can we make this ecosystem work in a way that sustains everyone. Um, and chefs as well, or you know by and large, you know a lot of them have been sourcing organic. Um, biodynamic for a while. There's still a handful, of course, that don't. Um, but more and more, we're seeing how this food system is interrelated. And we see that, of course, with restaurants in terms of, you know, like an example from the pandemic is, you know, uh, uh, local restaurant in San Francisco, as uh, the chef was saying, you know, I heard from our, our fish purveyor that he basically can't um, offer us fresh fish anymore because everyone's been so impacted by the pandemic, meaning they're not able to offer fish in restaurants that the, the fishermen said, we're going to freeze everything moving forward. And so it's one of those things where, you know, post pandemic, maybe the system changes such that fresh fish is no longer even an option for local chefs to get. So it's like, there's this acute awareness of how everything is, is interrelated. Um, and then on the investment side, we're, we're seeing, a, a, I mean, I'd say increasingly a fair amount of interest in, in donors who are wanting to support region ag and not necessarily knowing the right way to plug in. Um, there's, um, there's also some interest around permaculture and, you know, architects who are, are looking at the land and wanting to, to support region ag because they're seeing how that, um, having that sort of balance of like a home in nature, but a nature that supports 
uh, a home that's more integrated with the land really makes that ecosystem work. So there are a lot of different layers to this, and I would say it's definitely become a hot topic in the last six months or so. So you're expecting it to continue to go up, you think? Definitely. It's not drying up anytime soon. No, in fact, I'll say it quite the opposite. Um, there is so much um, sort of um, high level thinking around how to move money into regenerative mm -hmm. uh, methods. And that regenerative method is, is really a circular, economy, a circular economy model where you're putting more into the system than you're taking out. You're sort of closed loop. In other words, you're not sort of creating waste. And there's a, a recent example of a um, very well-known family that owns a very well-known private label, and they are palm oil producers. And they started to realize that um, when they grow cacao with palm, they have a synergistic relationship. Now they've got two crops and they're doing more for the soil. They're mitigating the risks around palm oil. And now they're producing a very high um, value cacao and they're gonna start bringing that into the United States. Um, this is something that came out of regenerative agricultural principles. They were looking for a sort of a synergistic plant system that could regenerate the soil while mitigating the sort of monocrop aspects of palm oil. And they landed on cacao and the two of those plants work very well together. Um, I can't speak specifically to the mechanisms. I don't fully um, understand and haven't really dug into it, but I think it shows how a major um, uh, investment into regenerative soil health around the conditions and mitigations of palm oil, which as we all know, can be a very nefarious type of monocrop. Mm -hmm. So they mitigated it by growing a very high beneficial crop of cacao in addition to and with the palm oil, which creates a much better solution for, for that whole system. Um, my, as I ref referenced earlier, there's a, a fund out of Colorado that's primarily focused on regenerative agriculture and soil health. They're doing a major project, which is corporate sponsored in California around almond. And they're looking at sort of soil, soil conditions, water retention, pollination, and they're looking at a, a very, very difficult crop for California because of the, the intensity of almond farming. And they're looking at it and how do we actually create a, a industrial system shift around a crop that is beneficial? but how do we make it beneficial? And the money that's coming into these, these types of organizations is mostly philanthropic sort of venture investment. We went back to that from an earlier, earlier term because these are really models that are around return of investment. And they're also the return of investment is capital. You're getting more than you put in, which means you can do more with it. Or the return on investment is for the, you know, the place we call home, the spaceship Earth, as Buckminster Fuller used to say while he was alive, is that this is all we got. So we need to take care of it. It's true. It's all we got. <laughs> and I would add, I would add, Justine, that what's really nice about Region Ag is it's actually it's an, an international concept. I mean, there's there's support from so many countries. It's like you're seeing an Oslo-based coffee farmer who literally took investment of his own, uh, sorry, not coffee farmer, but coffee roaster to work with some of his coffee farms in Central America and help them transition to, to regenerative ag processes. And you know, is willing to take that, that risk of loss himself in, in terms of teaching them how to do it. And then you're also seeing in Japan, like the equivalent of the, um, the, equivalent of the um, food and ag uh, board there basically supporting, I think it's a three years ago, I think it was up to 10% of all of their agriculture production to be regenerative ag, which is huge. If you think about that at a country, at a country level. And I don't know if you know Daniel Berchi. Do you know Daniel Berchi? He's out of Germany. Um, and I've had a variety of conversations with him. Who, he's uh, very big in, in regenerative agriculture out of Germany. Um, he does a lot of education and he tries to connect people all over the world to educate them on regenerative agriculture, whether it's businesses, whether it's people doing business, building businesses. So he'd be a great person to have a conversation with. Um, and I'm happy to connect you. <laughs> because so, so yeah, so that would be wonderful. And this model of regeneration is such a wonderful sort of topic because when we think about sort of this hybridization between philanthropy, impact investing, and traditional investing, 
what we're really saying is that we're cycling the, the capital. We're cycling it in terms of inputs and outputs. And yeah. so when we think about 86 fund and we think about sort of the other things that we're involved in when it comes to, to food system shift and transitional food systems and supporting local farmers and off farm producers and pre, pre paying for six months worth of inventory or buying tortilla machines for Nopalito so that they can produce a, a, a tortilla um, out of traditional um, ingredients that they import versus sort of the, the institutional or, 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 or in, in industrial agricultural ingredients. What we're really saying is, is that we're investing in ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and this is very circular. This is very regenerative. If we're um, not thinking about capital in terms of what I get versus what we get, and we continue to spin the wheel, then we all benefit from that. And so much of the capital systems, the investment model is about, I put something in and I get something more back, totally. but I don't put anything back in again. In other words, it's a one shot. In other words, many uh, venture capital, many sort of uh, typical sort of, I'm gonna invest in a granola company and the granola company is gonna go do what it does. Right. And the granola company is going to sell because maybe I have to force it to sell to repay myself or my investors. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of it. When we think about regenerative impact, when we think about regenerative investment in entrepreneurship, we're actually taking strategies where we all win, where we float the entire boat. And that's really a different sort of focus around how this capital flow is structured because we're not looking at investing in these organizations for a one return specific type of exit. We're thinking about it in terms of how do we help each other? How do we help what the entrepreneur needs? How do we help what the capital needs so it can recycle and do more good? And that's where we get this hybridization between traditional philanthropy, which really is in a lot of ways a one shot. We give it away and it goes and does something and we expect something positive in return, which is an outcome. But when we're thinking about regenerative capital, we're combining the fact that we're doing what philanthropy did, but we're also looking to grow that philanthropic pool so we can go do more. And that's where we start to get into this concept of we're building a better world for us all. Was there some, was there some moment or something in particular that motivated both you, Maggie, and you, Dave, to get into this specific kind of work? Definitely. <laughs> well, would you share? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, for me, it started, you know, in terms of thinking through, you know, having been an entrepreneur for most of my adult life at this point, um, thinking through all the different challenges that entrepreneurs face and how um, those that aren't venture backed, you know, really have to, I mean, I won't say everyone works hard, but effectively, if there are ways to support entrepreneurs with, with beneficial capital, um, you know, it, it's like, and, and I would have, you know, worked in this space probably sooner, but learning about it last summer, it's like going back to Dave's model of a granola producer. It's like knowing that a, that a granola producer could take on risk or charitable capital to get their, reach their next stage of growth and have much more favorable terms of repayment if repayment's required. Um, you know, give them in some cases a 0% loan, things that they can't even get from the SBA. It's, it's, for me, it's very moving to be able to support entrepreneurs who are really giving back to the environment, the community, um, in a way that gets them capital to do what they need to do. Because so often fundraising is the hardest part of entrepreneurship. It's like, or it takes the entrepreneur so much longer to move the needle on X, Y, Z goals because if they just had the capital sooner, they would be executing. Because entrepreneurs, by and large, are doers. And so, for me, that was really inspiring to know that we could um, mobilize uh, charitable capital to support entrepreneurs, and so that. That fascination came initially from, you know, how is it possible to transition from the risk capital side to charitable capital side? And we have Dave and I have those conversations all the time with folks who are used to working in the risk capital space, realizing that they can do all of this other beneficial work um, on the charitable side. So that's really where the inspiration came from. Um, and I think, you know, for me, it feels like we're just getting started because there's still this big educational component of really, you can do this. You have folks who've either had a DAF or have been doing charitable investing for years, but have always been working in the, the um, you know, with nonprofits and that sort of thing. So um, I'll pause there, but that's where the inspiration really started. How about you, Dave? So having worked in the sort of venture capital, private equity and institutional capital world for the better part of 20 years, it dawned on me that there's something broken. And that broken is that most of these sort of institutional sort of pools of capital invest in themselves. 
they're not investing in, in entrepreneurship. That money never makes it down to a granola producer. The granola producer relies on private capital, not institutional capital, to get going and to sort of work through their particular types of needs around delivering their products, building out supply and distribution, maybe CapEx and buying equipment, supply chain support and all their ingredients. That's all private. And so private capital really relies on people. It relies on people that have built sort of um, small uh, groups of investment pools or, 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 or have sort of coagulated into sort of uh, venture funds, which is really supported by limited partners, which are people. So we're not dealing in an institutional setting where there's just these gigantic pools of capital and they essentially support their own products like a global ETF 100 fund, for example. And what really became matter what really became to matter for me is that that global ETF hundred fund never finds its way to the small granola producer, but within that same gigantic system, there is this model which is a donor advice fund, and they're managed by these large institutionals, and there's almost a trillion dollars sitting in these funds. And most of that money is being invested in global ETF funds and or other types of sort of institutional credit facilities, which means it doesn't make it to the small granola producer. Mm -hmm. However, there are ways with which to do that. These types of structures can invest through these types of models that were, are available so that they can really do and make a difference in that granola um, producer's future. And the question then becomes is how to do that. And so the, the sort of shining light moment to me is um, we were put into a position about two years ago where I was supporting financially a social enterprise in the food system in Oakland that was doing incredible work with, with at-risk communities, training them so they could go into higher paying jobs in the food system, parolees and, and you know um, other types of, of really disadvantaged type of um, uh, members of their community in, in, an area, in an area of risk. And this particular social enterprise um, built a culinary kitchen and, and ultimately was servicing catering for large corporations. But it was really a training kitchen. And they started to have some, some challenges as social enterprises do. Um, COVID was really rough on them. Um, for another topic, they, they magnificently rose out of COVID like a phoenix because the CEO is incredibly innovative. Um, but where we ended up with that is a social enterprise is not a good investment for most investors, right? It's a very low return and the prospect of a big liquidity event is probably not going to happen. And so it's a perfect candidate for sort of a philanthropic hybridization of, of investment because it can pay back um, its obligations. It just can't pay them back on the big hockey stick that we all think about here in Silicon Valley. And so I started looking into that and went, well, wait a minute there's a lot of money that can support a company like that, but it doesn't know how. It doesn't know how to get in there. Um, a lot of money knows how to get in there like, like Refed and some of these other Red X, mm -hmm. these more philanthropic grant making machines, but, it, but the money that's expecting a return on its capital in a philanthropic tax advantaged way, doesn't know how to get there. And so it was really a shining light about who else is doing this. And there aren't many people and, but there's a trillion dollars sitting in these accounts at Morgan Stanley and Schwab and Fidelity and community funds and so forth that can be activated to get into these impeccable companies. And so really it's about plumbing the system. It's about showing the way forward, shining the light on it and saying, if this is something of interest, there are ways and it is very available and it's just about education and, and rinse and repeat. And we've moved a lot of money out of donor advice funds into a variety of different types of social enterprises and environmental enterprises over the last two years based on that one factor, which is how do we solve this problem now that isn't being solved around traditional philanthropy? And so what's your ultimate goal? I'm gonna ask both of you um, for the future of food and for the future of, social, of uh, in impact investing over the next three, five, you know, 10 years. Mary, why don't you lead off with that one? I'm gonna ask you too, Dave. <laughs> um, yeah, the future, I mean, from my perspective on future of food, it's, it's really supporting these systems at the local level, knowing that climate change is here and, um, and, and doing what we can with, with capital to support, um, to support these changes, whether it's region ag or educating consumers on, you know, the true cost of food of like why it costs 
you know, $25 maybe for a grass fed hamburger here and, you know, $12 here for a, you know, a non grass fed hamburger, what the difference is, what you're really supporting with your money. Um, I mean, those sound really surface level and I feel like we've kind of been skirting around them for the last decade, but it, it really, I think to make any sort of change, you have to, you have to get folks to believe that, um, that there's a difference that they can make with their, with their funds. And also just looking at the health impact, there's, mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of times folks don't realize that so often that what you consume is really it goes directly to impacting your health. Um, you know, I think what's the stat, our bodies are 70% water or something like that. So it's like, when you think about, anyway, I could wax on about health. I won't, I won't. Hear. I, <laughs> but, you know, it really talks to my mission. I won't go on, but it really, <laughs> I, you know, my mission, right. It's all about health and it's about educating and the consumers as well as the businesses to build a better food system. So, yeah. so well, Dave, and I, think, <laughs> I think the point it's like, you know, getting folks out onto the land, getting them, you know, outstanding the field launch, what in 20, before 2010, I think. And, and they're famous for these, you know, white tablecloth, elegant, multi-course dinners in the middle of the farm or on a beach or a vineyard. And, and, you know, there, there's a lot of fun to something like that. Uh, but the, I think the reality is when you think about getting people out into the land, getting them to visit a cattle farm or, um, you know, a, 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 an almond farm, like any sort of local farm of some sort of crop or, or item that they consume regularly and realizing, you know, even what it takes for a, a stone fruit farmer to get to the, to collect the, the fruit, the plums, the peaches, the apricots, nectarines, you have it, get to the farmer's market at the crack of dawn, set up the table, sell the fruit, put a smile on their face, make change. You know, it's a lot of work just to get that one peach to the table. And I think, you know, often you'll pass a lot of folks at the farmer's market and they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this peach cost me $1.50 for one peach, you know? And it's like, I, so my point is, I think getting folks onto the land is a way moving forward to really help um, generate that system and encourage them to want to give. It's kind of the same thing when you go to a, like a benefit gala and, you know, the donor is able to see like the true impact of like, I think of like homeless prenatal in this example, but, um, and then in terms of impact investing, I mean, David's already touched on it, but I think, hitting on the, you know, the, the goals around um, the, the 17 SDGs and ways in which we can really um, have an impact with, with charitable capital to, to support the environment, especially, um, you know, that's an area that I think will, there will be, you know, even more focused than there already is, because we're already seeing, I mean, for the three of us live in Northern California, and, you know, it, the question is sort of like, well, when is fire season going to start this year? And the reality is we didn't have a fire season prior to 2016 um, to speak of. So it's, you know, I think it's just, I think the, the in terms of the next three to five years, that's going to be the focus. Yeah, and we had a fire here in San Rafael just the other day. <laughs> well, I know, it's a red flag last week. Um, so oh, I, before you go on, I just wanted to touch on the whole like, going to the farmland. It's so important because we learn about food loss there uh, instead of food waste, because there is a differentiation. And we learn about the, the work that the farmers do and everything that goes into it. And I think that gets lost. It gets lost in, what, in, in, in the story and people don't understand. So when you were talking about education, it really resonates with me because I don't think and it's nobody's fault, right? We don't think about it all the time. We right. don't think about what goes into it. But, you know, one of the things that when you're talking about it, you're talking about the education and I'm shaking my head because I'm like, there's so much education that needs to be done because people just don't know. Consumers don't know. Even businesses don't know as they're putting it together. It, they're, they're getting the education as they're building their business, new entrepreneurs. So it's so important, um, and I and I and I think you know it's amazing work that you're doing, and I'm and I'm starting to try to work on it, and, and I just think it's just it, we're 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 starting to scratch the surface, and I just think there's so much to be done, and as people get more educated, I hope that we'll be able to see people that will people really buy into it and understand that it's not just for it's not it's not a fad, this is here to stay. It, it's not. It's it's for their health. It's for their families. It's for the future generations. It's for the planet. And in order to have a regen, you know, to build a better world, we need to start here. So I'm sorry, David. I just wanted no, to no I, I'm going to say exactly what you just sort of. I'm going to parrot right <laughs> because really the next five years or the next ten years, we've got an opportunity to really. Um, um, commit 
to a better, um, more integrated agroecology, sustainable. Well, I don't even like the word anymore. I, I think we're we're past sustainable. I think Overused we're, too. We're in a an era now where we need food security, mm -hmm. and we we see these these sort of environmental systems breaking down all over the world. We know that there's water shortage. We know that there's drought. We know that we have profound impacts from climate change that we don't have any concept how that's going to really affect our food systems. And so, so how to invest, how to think about um, agroecology, how to think about biodynamics, how to think about ecosystem um, in terms of supportive ecosystems um, that are, are, are healthy ecosystems that rely on themselves and can function on their own without chemical inputs or other types of machine inputs or so forth. Um, it's very well understood that a healthy and dynamic ecosystem is a very self-sustaining and nutrient loaded um, type of an ecosystem, which we benefit from. And I think we've, we, you know, we've kind of lost our way with the green revolution in terms of sort of augmenting nature um, as if we can do better, right? And in many ways, one can argue that, you know, all of the investment that went into the, the industrialization of food um, saved a lot of people from starvation. I think that's a very, very gallant type of an ex exercise in terms of what the Rockefellers did and what the Green Revolution did. However, at what cost? That's a really tough one because the environmental cost of the Green Revolution is extraordinary. And the industrialization of our food system has been at what cost? Diabetes, Alzheimer's, dementia, chemical poisoning. I mean, we can go on and on. And so the question then becomes is, is investment like General Mills and Danone? I mean, Danone was one of the, the most um, um, profound B corporations on the planet in the last bunch of years because they committed to regenerative act. They said as a, as a producer of dairy, which is one of you know, the perceivably most impactful um, industrial food systems on the planet. How do we think about it differently? How do we think about it as a company differently? How do we do it in a regenerative way so that it's actually much better? And what they found is they were much more profitable based on their regenerative models. There was capital investment but at the end of the day, they were able to come up with this cost plus approach. And the cost plus approach means that your, your farmers, your on farmers who are producing the milk, basically get a cost plus a profit. And they're able to do that because they've invested in the type of regenerative models where there's, there's price, price, price sort of management. And so they don't have to go to the spot market. And what we know about spot markets is it's what the market will pay. And usually it's the producer that loses. So this is a totally top-down approach to how we can think about our food systems differently where everybody wins. The farms win, there's higher animal welfare, there's better environmental management of those effluents that come out of that farm, there's better price management around sort of the cost plus approach, and a corporation that's committed to supporting that particular activity is a corporation that we haven't really seen before. Mm -hmm. And so other corporations are beginning to see this way too, because they're really betting on their future, and their future is not particularly bright. I mean, when you have monocrops that are failing due to different types of fungal disease that you no longer have chemicals that will treat it, or we have these sort of really wacky things around um, committed membership to Monsanto, where you can't grow anything or you're sued by Monsanto because you deviated from their particular agenda. And so these are all systems um, sort of approaches that we're starting to unravel a little bit. And it can happen from the top with the Danones of the world and the General Mills of the world and so forth, or it can happen with us and we can force that change with our own money and we can do it in a way that makes sense through our philanthropy and through our sort of venture philanthropic investing and so forth in these entrepreneurial models that are trying to make a difference. These small farm producers that are committed to Regen Ag, they're taking on the Rodale me mechanisms of permaculture, and they're starting to think about agroecology um, differently in terms of how they're producing um, and, and so forth. And there are so many examples um, of, of, of committed entrepreneurship that are, are in, in this particular type of realm that are doing things different. Um, I can think, you know, for this group who's, there's a wonderful one, um, I'm not promoting this at all, but there's Imlakesh is a great example of a commitment to regenerative ag. Um, they produce wonderful products and they're, they're in community um, in these foreign countries and they're planting the products that are, are native to these particular regions and they're producing food for us that is impeccable in its characteristics 
honors the community and the culture from which it was um, developed, and then provides a fair and, 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 and working wage to all in its supply chain. It can, for those that are uh, watching the video or even listening, can you just spell that for them? <laughs> Imlakesh. I think it's I M A L I M L A A E E S H. Um, okay, and we'll, we'll see if we can look that up and throw that in the show notes. But I want to thank you, Maggie, and thank you, Dave, for joining me today on Essential Ingredients. And if our folks wanted to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to reach out? Um, info at 86fund.org. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank everyone for tuning in today to Essential Ingredients. If you like this episode, you can follow us on Instagram. You can uh, follow us on um, iTunes. You can download us on uh, iHeartRadio. We're on all the regular channels. So uh, we're here every Tuesday with a new episode. So we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you guys for joining me. Oh, it's been Thank you for having great. Christine. It was so fun. It so. is I M I-M-L A K E S H Organics. Okay, wonderful. Okay, great. We will make sure to add that. And uh, when I will have Bonnie send you a note uh, when it's when we have a date for it. We'll have it edited. And if you have any hashtags, any headshots, did Bonnie email you already with asking for all that kind of stuff? Okay. Yeah. All right. Probably had you sign a little release because we do a video just to make sure that you're good with that. Um, and then we'll send you a YouTube video, any flyers, all that kind of stuff. Sounds great. Thank you, Justine. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. And we're... To find out more about this episode of Essential Ingredients and access show notes, check out Next Gen Chef and choose podcast in the menu bar. If you like this episode, head to iTunes or Next Gen Chef's YouTube channel to subscribe. Learn more about Next Gen Chef, the platform that powers this podcast, by checking out our website or visit us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Next Gen Chef. You can also check out my Instagram at Justine underscore Reichman. If you have thoughts about this episode or future episode ideas, leave us a comment at Next Gen Chef's YouTube channel or drop an email at team at nextgenchef.com. Thanks for joining us.